Thank you, everyone, for joining in this special seminar. My name is Kiyoshi Miyata, and I am an assistant professor at Kyushu University. Hope all of you enjoy this opportunity. So let me briefly explain the background of this event. This is a joint event between ChemStation and Q Colloquium. So ChemStation is the largest portal website of chemistry in Japan, initiated by Nichiro Yamaguchi. So he's now at uh, Wasa University and doing a, a full professor. So ChemStation was founded in 2000. So now ChemStation is numbered more than 100 chemists and keep publishing chemistry news in Japanese every day. So, and actually, uh, we have English and Chinese version as well. So, we hope we can act more globally to encourage chemistry field in a broad sense. The Chem Station has been regarded as a nice education source for chemistry in Japan. So, in fact, uh, Chem Station got education awards from Chemistry Society of Japan in 2017 and the Minister of Education Awards for Science and Technology in 2019. Now, let me briefly talk about a Q colloquium. So Q colloquium is a virtual colloquium series for photochemistry run by some scientists related to photochemistry in Kyushu University. Uh, me, Professor Yanai, Professor Nakanotani, uh, Professor Wakabayashi, uh, Professor Ono, and our students. So what is unique in this colloquium is that we provide the records of the lecture to ChemStation YouTube channel, hoping that YouTube lectures act as excellent studies resources for photochemistry. So if you are interested in, uh, please visit our website. The lecture is mostly in Japanese, but we are thinking about finding more international lectures. ChemStation also has an extended version of such virtual seminar called ChemStation Virtual Premier Lectures. Up to now, uh, we published three premier lectures on their YouTube channel. The lecture series were viewed by more and more chemists. For example, the first lecture uh, given by Professor Ishitani and Professor Adachi has been viewed by more than 3,000 times. Actually, this number made it the speakers too, so this will be an excellent opportunity in terms of publicity for the speaker. So we thought that it would be nice to make a joint event of our Kyokurokyun uh, and camp station, so, and Professor Afio Castellano uh, kindly accept our invitation. So this is actually the first international event for Chem Station and Q Crocium. So I am really, really excited. One more important thing I need to tell you is that this seminar is supported by Hamamatsu Photonics. Hamamatsu Photonics is a wonderful company offering a lot of sophisticated tools for research related to light. Please enjoy the commercial video from Pharmamath Photonics before the seminar. The video is in five minutes. The commercial talk is in Japanese, but the slides are prepared in English. So yeah, please enjoy the uh, commercial video. Chemiste Virtual Premium Lecture of Goran no Minasama. Konnichiwa. Hamamatsu Photonics Kabushikigaisha to Moshimas. Konkaiwa. Shinsotai o target to Nishita. 材料評価装置をご紹介させていただきます。浜松フォトニクスでは光冷気した際に物質が発する光、いわゆるフォトルミネッセンスを評価する装置を開発販売しております。フォトルミネッセンスを発する材料全般が対象で、有機化学、無機
カンタウルス QY プラスです。発光量子収率とは、光冷気した際に物質に吸収されたフォトン数と発光したフォトン数の比で表される光物理パラメータで、光物理過程の研究のみならず、材料の品質評価などにも用いられています。弊社の装置は、リファレンスサンプルが不要な絶対法による測定が可能で、短時間で簡単に計測できるという特徴があります。また、発光量子収率と密接な相関がある発光寿命を測定し、時間分解してフォトルミネッセンスを観測できる装置として、カンタウルスタウも取り扱っております。7種類の冷気光源を内蔵し、簡単計測を可能にしたモデルです。発光量子収率測定と蛍光寿命測定装置を両方揃えることで、同じサンプルでの多角的な材料評価が可能です。次に、今回のカステラーノ先生のご講演にも関連いたします、フォトンアップコンバージョンの発光量子収率測定例についてご紹介させていただきます。本測定結果は、弊社装置のユーザー様である九州大学、君塚研究室、柳井先生よりご提供いただきました。この場をお借りして、深くお礼申し上げます。三重構三重構消滅に基づくアップコンバージョン発行の量子収率を、弊社の装置、カンタウルス QI プラスを用いて測定した結果をご紹介します。ドナー分子であるオクタエチルポルフィリンの発菌作体を、532ナノメートルの光で冷気しますと、最低冷気三重構状態が生成されます。次に、このドナー分子からアクセプター分子である90ジフェニルアントラセンに三重構エネルギー移動が起こり、三重構三重構消滅過程を経て、アップコンバージョン発光が起こります。こちらは、このサンプルについて、発光量子収率の冷気強度密度依存性を測定し、相対法との比較を行った結果です。両者の良い一致が確認され、絶対法の信頼性が確認されました。最後に一つ、新製品のご紹介をさせていただきます。弊社では、2021年8月、ODPL 測定装置の販売を開始します。ODPL とは、オムニディレクショナルフォトルミネッセンス、全方位フォトルミネッセンスのことを指し、これを用いて、半導体結晶の評価に必要な内部量子効率、IQE の定量評価が可能になります。本製品により、LED や太陽電池材料として注目されているペロブスカイト材料をはじめ、各種化合物、半導体材料の品質向上に向けた研究開発の効率を高めることができると期待されます。浜松フォトニクスでは、各種発酵材料のフォトルミネッセンスを簡単かつ高精度に評価する装置を多数取り揃えております。詳細は、弊社システム営業推進部までお問い合わせください。以上、浜松フォトニクスからのご案内でした。OK、uh,、then it's time to start the lecture.The speaker is Professor Phil Castellano from North Carolina State University.So this lecture is chaired by our friends,、uh, Professor Nobuhiro Yanai,、uh, Nobu Yanai from Kyushu University.So please enjoy. Hi,、uh, good evening and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm、uh, Nobuhiro Yanai, Nobu Yanai from, and, as a, and I'm an associate professor in Kyushu University. And、uh, this is my great pleasure to welcome、uh, Professor Phil Castellano to our、uh, first international、uh, Q Colloquium lecture. So,、uh, 
thank you, Phil, for accepting our invitation. So uh, before starting his talk, let me briefly uh, introduce about the uh, biography of uh, Professor Phil Castellano. So uh, uh, Phil got uh, his PhD from John Hopkins University in 1996, uh, working with Professor Gerald Meyer. And after doing uh, NIH postdoc fellow at the University of Maryland, uh, he accepted the position as assistant professor at Boring Green State University in 1998. So he was promoted to associate professor in 2004 and to professor in 2006. And he became a, a director of the Center for Photochemical Sciences in 2011. And then it, in 2013, he moved to North Carolina State University. And now he's uh, taking the Good Night Innovation Distinguished Chair. So uh, he was appointed as a, a fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry in 2015, and he got IAPS award in photochemistry in 2019, and also he was elected as an AAS fellow uh, in 2020. So he is also the uh, uh, editor in chief of Chemical Physics Reviews, a uh, new uh, peer review journal from AIP Publishing Group, and. Actually, I'm also serving as an associate editor in this channel, and I'm sure he will explain more about this channel later. And uh, uh, his interests are very broad and covers many aspects of photochemistry. And he's particularly well known for his pioneering works on photon up conversion. That's the main topic of today, I guess. Actually, when I got my academic post in Japan in, in Kyushu in 2012, I decided to start also working on the photon up conversion. So I joined this field. And at that time, I visited Phil's lab at Boring Green. And he was very open and accepted my visit. And I, I had, we had a very nice discussion. I could learn a lot from him and his group members. So I really appreciate that. So that time, what really impressed me was that in addition to science, of course, science, but he was also very knowledgeable about eating and drinking. So we <laughs> had a very nice time. And uh, honestly, I really wanted to host him in Japan, but uh, you know, I cannot do that now. But instead, I'm very happy to host him online today in this special occasion. So uh, Phil, maybe uh, please share your slide. And so, uh, today, uh, he will talk about the uh, photochemical up conversion using traditional metal uh, uh, comp photosensitizers spanning the deep rock. And after his talk, we will have a discussion time. So, please be prepared to it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Phil, uh, please start your lecture. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Nobu, and, and thank you, Kiyoshi, for uh, the kind introduction. And you know, thank you for all of you for being here today. Um, I recognize a lot of names from all over the world, and I hope very soon we will all be able to enjoy some of this eating and drinking together again, um, especially the scientific discussions that we always have while we're eating and drinking together. Um, so I decided, based on the fact that this is both a Q colloquium as well as chem station, I decided to really focus this particular talk on our molecular photochemical up conversion program, um, starting from the origin point in 2003, um, and then where we are today in 2021. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with pho photon up conversion, um, the first thing I'll tell you is look, based on all of these covers here, it, it photographs absolutely beautifully. And the idea really is, is that you can take low energy photons to high energy photons by performing uh, a, a sequence of two, sub, uh, two sequential energy transfer reactions. And some of the reviews that have been composed by my group uh, are listed here. Um, so before I dive into photochemical up conversion, um, I also wanna mention that in more recently, my group has been very interested in going beyond molecules for triplet sensitization. And we sort of discovered this idea that you can use um, quantum dots 
as uh, triplet sensitizers for performing uh, a variety of photochemical transformations as well as uh, driving photon up conversion. I saw Ming Li Tong, Tong is here also, and you know she's the world's expert on that subject. Um, but the idea really is, is that um, triplet excitons are everywhere or triplet excited states are everywhere. And I encourage everyone to really look very broadly um, in various research programs of where you can really take advantage of triplet excited states. They're, they're everywhere and you'd be surprised in all of the interesting places you can find them. Uh, so in terms of quantum dots, these are all the contributions my group has made really ever since the first paper in 2016. And we kind of continue this work now with all of these talented people. Um, and I, like I said, I won't really mention a lot of names until the end. Um, but the idea really is, is I encourage everybody to really think broadly about anything that absorbs light. You can really think about taking advantage of it for a variety of reasons in terms of photochemical transformations. Um, so I thought I would do something different today. How did we get started in photochemical up conversion? And I have to be completely honest, we weren't intending to study photochemical up conversion. That was never the, never the driving force here. So what did we do? Well, we were interested in sequential energy transfer processes, namely, could you excite uh, selectively a ruthenium-2 metal to ligand charge transfer chromophore and make a triplet excited state in intramolecularly. Um, but it, was, it went beyond that. This was the model system. Our compounds of interest were basically, could we excite it and do one energy transfer? Could we excite it with a lot of photons and do two energy transfers or three energy transfers within the same broad laser pulse? So we were you know, terming this at the time, regenerative triplet sensitization, to really be able to make a lot of excited states on, on a single molecule. And we knew that would require you know, high pulse energies. So before we really embarked down this pathway, we made this model compound and we excited it selectively. And this is with a nitrogen uh, pump dye laser, which is 65 microjoules per pulse, but, but these are picosecond laser pulses. So there's a lot of power. And what we immediately noticed was exciting these kind of in, you know, towards like the green. If you looked at the cuvette, you saw blue fluorescence. It was really obvious. So we decided let's like turn our detector backwards and let's see what it looks like in a time solved experiment. And this is what you had seen is clear signature of delayed fluorescence from this molecule. And then we kind of recognized, oh, well, what we're probably doing is we're making two triplets on two different molecules. They're annihilating and generating the singlet fluorescence you see. But the problem was the singlet fluorescence here overlaps the metal to ligand charge transfer absorption band. So then we thought the intramolecular strategy for doing this would be terrible because you're naturally going to quench the excited state you make by fret. So we separated the chromophores. And then of course, we were pleasantly surprised that under the same exact experimental conditions here, just matching the concentrations, we saw uh, like basically a three and a half fold increase in the delayed fluorescence we saw. But this was the first experiment we actually did that demonstrated very unequivocally that you could do photochemical up conversion. And then we then recognized that, oh, this is pretty exciting. So, um, what else are the hallmarks of photochemical up conversion? Well, if it is a sensitized triple triplet annihilation mechanism, it should have a quadratic power dependence, which it did with respect to the incident pulse energy. And as you can see, we're plotting the, uh, the, the basically the integrated delayed fluorescence intensity versus the pulse energy. So our original experiments in this area were all pulse laser experiments. And most people don't actually know that. Um, because it's in the first paper, which is the one that, you know, some people know about, but not everybody recognizes. And then the, similarly, if you excite in the, in, the, in the blue and then turn your detector backwards, you can actually get the spectra of, at the, of the delayed fluorescence you see, and clearly it's anthracene. 
Um, and then, of course, there's a little bit of unquenched residual fluorescence from anthracene in the same molecule, so you can excite it directly, and you see that the spectra match. So unequivocally, yeah, that's, that's photochemical upconversion um, going on, and it's resulting from the fact that we have this bimolecular reaction um, from two triple energized um, bichromophores. So ultimately, this set the stage for everything that came after. And then we immediately recognize something because my group has had a long history, um, not anymore, um, but has a long history, especially back then, of working on disensitized solar cells. So here's a typical ruthenium complex um, that would be uh, surface anchored to titanium dioxide. And this is the photo action spectrum. So this is the incident photon to current efficiency in percent. And you see the same feature no matter what your sensitizer happens to be. At longer wavelengths, you get roll off. And this is equivalent to what happens in semiconductor materials when effectively they cannot absorb the sunlight anymore, then they can't convert any of those longer wavelengths into photocurrent. And that limits your power conversion efficiency. So we had this idea, and you know, we never really explored this in a lot of detail. Tim Schmidt has uh, done this uh, really beautifully, so has Ken Hansen. Um, but what we, what we thought at the time was, what if we have a sensitizer that can sensitize the disensitized solar cell? And the idea would be if it has this absorption, and then we can induce luminescence into the peak of the IPCE curve in these devices, that would then give you power conversion efficiency, which then integrates more of the solar spectrum. And this was the concept is, can you really capture and convert subband gap solar photons using this concept? But it required a massive amount of effort to prove that you could actually, you know, really actually do this for real. And that was our whole motivation. So if we swing back to the original systems that we were looking at, we have this ruthenium metal to ligand charge transfer photosensitizer and just anthracene as a triplet acceptor. And if you just compare the Yablonsky diagrams, it becomes very obvious how you design a photochemical upconversion uh, donor acceptor pair. What you want is you want to sandwich the singlet and triplet levels of the sensitizer in between those of the molecule that's going to serve as the acceptor annihilator. That's really the critical feature. Um, other than that, you'd like to have the ability to do fast um, energy transfer between the two chromophores, and you would like the triplet excited state of the acceptor to be really long lived to give you the opportunity to engage in bimolecular energy transfer with other energized triplet molecules. Um, but if you put all of that together, um, what ultimately happens is, is that you can then do this triplet triplet annihilation, which is really two triplet excited states that collide and do dexter energy transfer. Um, that's triplet triplet annihilation, TTA. Um, you make the singlet, and as long as you have enough energy in the two triplets to put you on the singlet surface, you fluoresce out a photon. And that gives you these beautiful pictures that you see here and here, where you're going in with green laser beams and you see this beautiful blue light coming out, which is really the anthracene fluorescence. Um, stoichiometrically, so everybody's on the same page, you have to basically make two triplet excited states in order to generate two triplet sensitized excited states in order to get one molecule um, that's going to give you higher energy emission or higher energy chemical transformations as it will turn out. Um, so the highest possible efficiency based on absorbed photons for this process is 50%. And there's got a lot of a lot of a lot of details about um, quantum efficiencies of these processes. Um, we originally based this on the fact that when people talked about triple triple annihilation in the old literature, they based everything on the fact that you had to absorb two photons, so everything would scale. So 50% would be multiplied by two to scale it to 100%. And that is sort of the way that we took it the whole time. Um, we've now made some recommendations for how to revise that, but a lot of the old original numbers are in that genre where everybody's multiplying by two. Just that's important for the students to recognize. 
Um, and of course, we didn't really come up with this concept. It was originally reported um, in 1962 by Parker. Uh, Parker's the author of Photoluminescence of Solutions. I would highly recommend check out that book if you can find it. Uh, we have a copy in my lab, but it's uh, it's been out of print for a really long time. But fantastic book on fluorescence uh, spectroscopy. Um, and then more into the technical details. So if you excite out here in the green, turning your detector anti-Stokes, you can see as a function of incident continuous wave laser power, you generate anthracene fluorescence in this mixture. And that follows very beautifully the quadratic incident light power dependence. And it's quadratic for a simple reason. You have to have two acceptors sensitized in order to generate this fluorescence. So that's where the square comes from in the rate law. And it's as simple as that. But what was amazing to us is under CW power at really low concentrations, this stuff worked amazingly well. And, and that was the shock to us. So then, of course, you then believe you have to, how do you make this better? The first step for us, and, and I'm walking you through this just so you can see the way we thought about these problems, and some of which were naive and some of which were perceptive, that, but you know, I'll let everybody judge what, what they think is uh, really smart decisions and really bad decisions. So the first thing was anthracene fluorescence is only 30%. So we immediately figured if we went to diphenylanthracene, if we did everything right, we're gonna fluoresce out most of the photons that we can, we can generate uh, through up conversion. And as you can see between zero and, and one milliwatt, we were generating no problem, uh, lots of up converted photons, easy to visualize, no problems, and easy to visualize in a cuvette. And this was the one that got recognized by CNE News. And this came at a good time because this was um, right after I was promoted to associate professor and I think helped lead me to get promoted to full professor relatively fast. Um, so anyway, then you recognize the other pieces. So the ruthenium tristipyridine is a great sensitizer and all the molecules in those classes are really good triplet sensitizers. The problem is, their lifetimes are really limited to about one to two to three microseconds, depending on the ligands you use. So that led us to recognize the fact that, well, if we use you know, metalloporphyrins as triplet sensitizers, we can extend those lifetimes of the sensitizer into the hundreds of microseconds time scale. Now, what does that do for you? Well, tau zero now in the stern volmer expression becomes such a long lifetime that what you recognize is you can get away with much lower quencher concentrations and you can do this up conversion much better because you're not going to have as many inner filtering effects from the sensitizer. So you can use lower concentrations of sensitizer and lower concentrations of acceptor. That was really critical because now this is what was amazing to me. Our first experiment with palladium-2 octaethyl porphyrin and diphenyl anthracene, this is done in our fluorimeter with non-coherent light exciting right here. And you can see the residual porphyrin phosphorescence is here, but look at the sensitized DPA fluorescence. And you notice exactly what I was telling you. It's not interfiltered anymore. That's the authentic um, fluorescence spectrum of diphenyl anthracene. And it still follows the quadratic dependence as expected. So really, you're recognizing all of these things now that you have to really control the kinetics of all of this or the lifetimes of all of the, all of the components in order to make this really work. And you know that was our goal to remember, we wanted to make DSSC viable um, materials to be able to do subband gap sensitization. So passing sunlight through a couple of long pass filters, you can see the DPA fluorescence. It looks definitely better and more professional in a fluorimeter. Um, and you know, just students don't do this anymore, but literally my, my student at the time put, the, put these precious optics in between two rocks, which is kind of like what you never want to do, by the way, but um, I was in a good mood because I saw this, so I wasn't upset about the rocks. 
Um, and then uh, this is the hand of Evgeny Danilov, who's still in my group to this day. <laughs> and uh, you can kind of see here, we're doing it in a, in a room, just focusing the sunlight through an optic and then through the long pass filter to generate the subconverted fluorescence. So we can do all of this with non-coherent light, which was really what we set out to do in the first place. Um, then the bigger challenge, how do you integrate into solar cells? Well, we can't use solutions. You need solid materials to do this properly. And this is where I had an incredibly valuable collaboration with Chris Vader at Case Western University. He's now at Freeborg in Switzerland. Um, but we were both in Northern Ohio, an hour and a half away from each other. And we said, I said, Chris, how do I get, um, get how, do you, how do you give me a polymer that allows bimolecular diffusion? And he says, oh, you need low TG materials. And I'm like, do you have any? And he says, yes. And he sent his students to work with my postdoc over two days. We had this picture in two days. So this is a really bad polymer. Um, but this is an epichlorohydrin, uh, you know, ethylene oxide copolymer, terrible material to work with, but we managed to get um, upconverted um, fluorescence in thin films of this material. And then we started to play with different donor acceptor mixtures. So this is now with a, a thalocyanine upconverting the rubrine. Um, funny things happen along the way. My student accidentally dropped a pipette tip bulb into an upconverting mixture. And then just for fun, the rubber is a soft polymer and we recognized even that upconverted. So it, it, this was a really, really fun time in my laboratory. And our collaboration with Chris really spanned several years and um, we really enjoyed that whole time working with those material scientists because we were able to really make things happen. And then these are all of the various materials that were involved. I won't go into all the details. Um, Tico Flex is a medical grade approved polymer in the United States. So we sort of like that as a solid material. And again, there's the up conversion, you know, working in this, in this uh, solid polymer. Um, it's simply because the, the, the glass transitions of these materials is like 100 Kelvin. So if you drop them in liquid nitrogen, you completely shut off the, uh, the photochemical upconversion process. Um, but anyway, we, we managed to go through all of these different materials. And then it became obvious the next step is going to be, can we move things further to the red? So then we started to go to benzanulated porphyrins as sensitizers, and then we got creative. We said, we got to get away from aromatic hydrocarbon acceptors in all of these upconversion mixtures. So we started using Bodipi dyes, and both of these came from Raymond Ziesel, who collaborated with me on a number of projects for about 15 years. Um, and you can see that we could do red to green, red to yellow. I mean, as I said before, these things photograph beautifully. Um, but again, they all follow the same design principle is the single triplet levels of the sensitizer are really sandwiched in between those of the acceptor annihilator. And if you just follow that simple rule, you can find like enormous numbers of, of dye molecules that have low energy triplet states that are able to annihilate even laser dyes. So I would highly recommend just like you know, be, be, you know, feel free to explore. Um, there's no, no, uh, there's no problem with trying to do some experiments occasionally that might not be obvious. It, it's a really good idea. Um, so then building upon really work from, uh, from Mangazi's group in Italy, um, we kind of said, I bet we should be able to get a quadratic to linear power dependence using non-coherent light. But the, font, the concept of what makes this really work is, is you got to recognize something that's really strange for photochemistry. You really need to absorb a lot of photons. So you need really high sensitizer concentrations to absorb a lot of photons. That's not how you do most photochemical experiments. You're taught to use optically dilute samples. So you have to kind of do this to have the rate of photon absorption be as high as possible. But the other way you can do it is you can blast it with laser sources, which is what a lot of people do. 
And then you can use lower concentrations, but you can still get to the linear power dependence. Um, but the idea on the other side of this is if you have few absorbed photons, then you're always going to be pinned to this quadratic dependence, which we very clearly have shown you exclusively throughout this whole presentation so far. So we were really concerned about doing things at very low power, very low concentration. So this forced us into the quadratic regime all the time. And then we recognize, well, if we want to be as high uh, efficiency as possible, we got to get the processes linear, but we have to get a lot of photons absorbed. And if we're using non-coherent light, we have to up the sensitizer concentration. So that was a paradigm shift in my research group was around this time where we recognized we got to kind of change how we do things. And Ultimately, that led to now new upconverting materials that we can then get quantum yields over 20%. And this stuff in this paper here, this is, these are the best optical quality polymers we've ever used. They're called ClearFlex 50. It's a commercial mixture that you can basically mold into any shape or size that you want. Uh, so I would recommend this as a really good platform for hosting photochemical upconversion or anything requiring bimolecular reactions. Um, but then, of course, you know, to get to some of the things we wanted to get to, we were also at the same time in parallel really fascinated with can we do near infrared to visible photon upconversion? Because that had never really been done before. And a couple of the ways that we sort of recognized this was just like slow and steady. Um, new Bodipi dyes, this particular one was made by one of my colleagues at NC State. This does not actually pie stack. So you can use massive concentrations of this and you can see here, look at that beautiful up conversion from this molecule. So again, um, you just gotta get creative about the donor acceptor pairs that you use. Um, this was particularly another creative one. We used a, we used a texafrin based on cadmium 2 plus with um, effectively rubrine. And you can bring in an 800 excitation beam into just rubrine, you see nothing. But if you mix the two, look at that, you get the yellow fluorescence from rubrine. So this was one of our first examples of near infrared to visible uh, photon up conversion. And if you do the same experiment with non-coherent light in a, in a fluorimeter, again, you see that you can make this work. And, by, and at this time, we were really using like higher sensitizer concentrations to make this all function. And that was the real goal of, of how we did it. Um, then, uh, you know, of course, we started to work with Mike Theory at Duke University. And Mike makes all of these beautiful donor acceptor compounds. And if you'll notice, it has porphyrins built into these MLCT photosensitizers all in the same molecule. Um, without getting into all the fundamental photophysics of this, this red line here is the absorption spectrum of that compound. And there's all of this wacky intensity borrowing going on and everything else. But the idea is, is that this is the low energy absorption band, which now spans into the near infrared. And it generates this singlet fluorescence, believe it or not. It has a low energy triplet state, but it generates singlet fluorescence, which is crazy um, in, in our you know, sort of opinion about these things. But in general, what you can then do is you can use the triplet states of these molecules, again, to sensitize rubrine fluorescence. And the idea really is, is I shut the light off in, in the room, rubrine only, nothing. And then you see how, how bright this comes out when you can actually absorb the red light. Um, but the, the proof is in, can you do anything with it? So we were also interested in, can you do imaging? And one of the ways that we thought about doing imaging was, can you use photochemical upconversion to actually image an object where the, where the donor acceptor pair is immersed? And, and clearly we're showing this here that this is definitely possible. So you can kind of think about things in a little different context once you start to recognize all of the things you can do with this process. And as, I, as you can tell, everything I've shown you right up to this point has all been light generation. And we're going to kind of continue that theme now. But 
what I want to show you is, is that in parallel to all of these fancy sensitizers, we also recognize that it would be good to go to other metal to ligand charge transfer excited states based on earth abundant metals. And we have a whole program in copper one MLCT excited states. So we just decided let's like test these out for photochemical up conversion. And you can, you know, use this particular MLCT complex to up convert to, to uh, perylene and even to bodipides again. So this is a red absorbing MLCT, or it's kind of hard to call this like really red absorbing um, because it, its absorption spectrum really expands out above 600 nanometers here. So you can excite you know, in the red and generate green and blue uh, fluorescence. And I don't think I have to go through all of the detailed experiments here again, but you kind of recognize the fact that as long as you sort of follow that, that really original um, design criteria I mentioned earlier, you can get this to work with a lot of different donors and acceptors. And that, that's really the critical part of this. Um, you know, another part of my research program is really focused on how do we design through structural variation, long lifetime metal to ligand charge transfer copper one complexes. And there's a lot of information on here, but the key things are that you have to control the flattening distortion in order to control the lifetime. So that requires a lot of ultrafast spectroscopy, which I won't get into. It also requires a lot of DFT calculations to figure out um, structure uh, variation and what that's going to do to the flattening distortion. Um, but without getting into all of those details, what you, what you recognize is, is that the shorter you can make all of these time constants on ultra fast time scales, the longer the lifetime of the MLCT complex, and that the better it's going to be for being susceptible to triple triplet annihilation processes. So um, here's just a, a typical series of, of three compounds. And what I want to just illustrate to you is this was our new design, and it was based conceptually on the idea that Macmillan originally had. If you put three eight methyl groups next to the two nine substituents, it forces the two nine substituents in a, in a particular direction towards the coordination site. It can't, it, they can't actually bend outward. And that's, that's really a very important design criteria because what you recognize is, is that this molecule distorts the most, it has the biggest stoke shift. This molecule distorts a little less, it has less of the stoke shift. This one is really sterically arrested. It has the least stoke shift. So what does that do? Well, energy gap wise, this blue one, which is this, is the longest lifetime, which is shown here. The middle one is the next longest lifetime. And then DMP is a very short lifetime. So, so this is you know, good for the lifetime component that we need. It's energetically the less stoke shifted because it doesn't distort. So therefore it has the highest excited state energy, which is then valuable for driving photochemical up conversion to a variety of substrates. And there's a lot of other stuff here, which I won't get into, but the idea really is, is that you can systematically control these molecules and they actually wind up being better than the ruthenium-2 compounds in photochemical up conversion. And we approach this all the same way. You take your copper MLCT excited state. We used a variety of um, anthracene-based acceptors here with different fluorescence quantum yields. And you can kind of see that, yeah, we do stern vollmer analysis. We sort of know how to optimize the quenching. We, we know how to optimize light absorption. We know how to do all of this stuff. And then you get to, this, you get to these plots, which are very typical. Um, we, we see up conversion in all three acceptors and we maximize the quenching, which is why the, those are selected at different concentrations. And then when you look at the quantum yield for up conversion, um, and this is the normalized quantum yield, so these are all multiplied by two. Um, what you get is when you get to the linear regime, uh, the power density is basically, you know, effectively increasing power density basically gives you a limit to the, to the yield that you can observe. And that's just well-established um, kind of stuff. Um, but with copper, we can get the 17% with diphenylanthracene, which is much better than we ever could get with, with ruthenium-2. 
So it just shows you um, even, you know, these subtle things of changing sensitizers um, really has an impact on, on the types of uh, photochemical up conversion efficiencies you can realize. And, you know, keeping, you know, in that, you know, keeping in that idea, um, what I want to show you too is, is that you can do all of these typical plots of looking at the upconverted emission intensity versus the, in, versus the power density, or you can actually turn this into absorbed photons. It, it, it's all the same. Uh, but this is all done with 488 nanometer light. And you basically see that you always get this conversion of quadratic to linear, you know, quadratic to linear, and where they cross is the i value, which I'll get into in a little while. But what I want to show you is if you do this experiment with anthracene under two different conditions, this one favors light production. The one on the top actually favors precipitation. But what's that precipitate? It's the, it's the 4 plus 4 cyclo addition product of, of anthracene. So why do we care about that? Well, this is an interesting idea because this represents a way to convert solar photons into a thermal uh, storage mechanism. So how do we propose to do this? Well, basically the idea is in typical anthracene dimerization, you excite in the UV and you, you basically get the four plus four cycle addition product. But here, the way it's working is we make triplet anthracene sensitized. We get annihilation, which makes singlet anthracene. If you have a high concentration of ground state anthracene, this is the four plus four reaction. It dimerizes to make this dimer. This dimer precipitates from most solutions because it's very nonpolar. The interesting thing about this particular dimer is that when it's melted, it has a negative enthalpy. So it's storing energy in a metastable state as a solid. And of course, you can put this in chemistry terms, so it's minus 42 kilojoules per mole, but in more engineering terms, it's storing 118 joules per gram of material. And then other anthracene derivatives can increase the energy value up to like even 200 uh, joules per gram. So we tend to think that this is an interesting idea because you can do effectively photocatalytic formation of this dimer using sunlight. You can isolate the product in probably kilogram scales and maybe turn this into a way to be when it's melted to generate steam to drive turbines. So there is like a very interesting concept that's built into this for really doing chemothermal energy storage using metastable compounds to do so. Just an idea I'm throwing out there um, just to give you a sense of what's possible. Another really interesting collaboration that developed over the last couple of years in my group is with Karsten Millsman and his student Yu Zhang at West Virginia University, where they really developed an entirely new class of zirconium-4 ligand to metal charge transfer chromophores. For those of you that don't know this, uh, zirconium-4 is actually D0, which sets it up to be ligand to metal charge transfer naturally. But zirconium-4 is also the seventh most abundant earth, uh, or, or sorry, seventh most abundant uh, metal on earth. So this is a very earth abundant metal to be using in sensitizers. But what's really interesting is it has this very high extinction coefficient, almost 30,000, right in the visible. So right around like a little above 500 nanometers. And what's amazing about this compound is it has this really interesting admixture of it looking at you know, the frontier orbitals. There's a lot of ligand to metal charge transfer character, and there's a lot of ligand centered character. So this sets you up in a, in a really interesting way to effectively you know, kind of think about mixing in ligand triple with this. And ultimately, that gives you a 325 microsecond room temperature lifetime. That's crazy in this, in this field. And look at the Stoke shift. So this is also telling you there's like singlet character to this excited state. So Karsten contacted me originally to like help him understand what was going on here. And of course, we, uh, you know, we took all of these compounds. This one, the mesotheal is much better. 
Um, and again, quantum yield of, of uh, photoluminescence from this is 45%, but it has like a 350 microsecond lifetime, but it's the only zirconium compound I've ever seen that's air and moisture stable. So we can make these up conversion solutions on the bench top when we do it and work with this on the bench top. Um, so we published this in 2020, but what was fascinating was they got a single exponential emission decay and they kind of originally had this assigned as this must be singlet fluorescence, but it singlet fluorescence doesn't really jive with that 350 microsecond lifetime. So we naturally did what we do in my group. We, we dive into all the photophysics and we do the temperature dependence of this, of this emission band. And what you immediately notice is if you go cold enough, all you see is the low energy part of that spectrum is, is retained. And then what happens if you go higher? Well, as you go increase in temperature, you're driving up the higher energy emission band. This is a classic example of thermally activated delayed fluorescence. And if and basically the triplet, the triplet phosphorescence is here, the singlet energy is right there, but you can fit the temperature dependent data and you get exactly the same energy gap as you measure experimentally by the spectra. Um, but the idea really is, is that it's got a pretty small singlet triplet splitting. And this is the reason why the singlet manifold has this like incredibly long lifetime. It's being fed back by this incredibly long lifetime ligand center triplet reservoir. So that sets you up uh, in, a, in a really nice way for ver having very little Stokes loss. So the excited state you make is really retained. And then there's a number of groups worldwide that are using TADF photosensitizers in photochemical upconversion, but we decided let's do this a little bit differently. Let's now make a lot of different diphenylanthracene derivatives and see if we can you know, kind of do anything better than diphenylanthracene married to this particular sensitizer. And as you can see here, we, we get you know, kind of similar fluorescence properties in all of them. We have an absolute quantum yield apparatus. So these are all really high fluorescence quantum yields, they're all beautifully blue again. Um, and the idea is the emission bands of all of these molecules fit into effectively the, the main depression in the absorption band from the zirconium-4 photosensitizer. So we, fit, we felt that we do up conversion, we can up convert, and we won't have really any major problems with interfilter effects. So that's what we did. Um, ultimately, we, we combined all of this together, and you can very clearly see, you see up conversion in all, the, in all facets. But I figured in this particular project, I would, I would go through a little more detail, because I've only been showing you pretty pictures, but I want to tell everybody there's a lot of spectroscopy behind all the pretty pictures. So in every case, you have to do certain Bomer analysis, both static and dynamic, and make sure that your rate constants match because that you have to have dynamics or Bomer quenching to really make this work as well as possible. All of these have massive certain Bomer constants. That's really great. So this means energetically downhill, but very fast and very efficient energy transfer in the first step. You do transient absorption to prove in every single case that you're making the triplet excited state of diphenylanthracene. We know that. We do additional transient absorption experiments to get all of the parameters of the bimolecular um, triplet triplet annihilation. I will not show you that data because that's just way too specialized for this particular case. And you can see that the fluorescence generated is delayed in time. So this is all classic examples of, again, sensitized uh, triple triple annihilation processes. But here's where this is different. My student doing what she always does, this is Mo Yang. Let's do everything under optimized conditions and let's look at the quadratic to linear power dependence. So she does this experiment with all of these, all four of these sensitizers, and everybody in this room should be kind of scratching their heads. Why is this linear in this ridiculously low power density, or even if you want to think about it in terms of power, look at where it's linear. Down in like as low as we can measure, it's linear. So you, you kind of start wondering, we have this absence of the weak annihilation regime, 
And then we kind of think about, obviously this means very high efficiency up conversions being sensitized by this complex, like unprecedented to us. And then it was like, can the photochemical up conversion efficiency really be limited by the quantum yield of the acceptor? Like that's almost what we were thinking we were seeing. So then of course, we, we just took a step back and said, well, let's just make sure we can see quadratic to linear. And the way we had to do it was let's move the I value around. Well, how do you move the I value around? Well, you just lower the triplet energy transfer efficiency. So when we dropped it to 14%, we saw that we now have two to one and the I value happens about 2.3 milliwatts per square centimeter. When we increase the efficiency up to 50%, we can kind of see we move it to about um, 0.72. So it goes down in the power plot. And remember when we do this and everything is optimized, it's over 95% efficiency. So that was why we couldn't actually see this uh, turnover point or see any quadratic dependence whatsoever. So clearly this is a sensitized TTA mechanism with all of the donors and acceptors we're using here. Um, to get into the details a little more, um, this is again, Monguzi's treatment. Um, and then there's been some refinements from, from Tim Schmidt's group. But the idea really is, is the I value to a rough approximation. And this is a very rough approximation and you know, take this with a grain of salt. It's related to the triplet decay of the acceptor, the bimolecular triple triplet annihilation rate constants. So those are fixed in our experiments. Um, and then alpha, which is really the absorption coefficient of the sensitizer at the excitation wavelength, that's also fixed in our experiments. So this is, the, this is why we varied um, the efficiency of the triple triplet energy transfer reaction. That's the one parameter we could readily control. So if you kind of think about it, we can do some ratio metric uh, concepts here of really changing this and then, you know, knowing what the absorption coefficient is um, at 514 nanometers. You can kind of see here under the non-optimized conditions, we have those I values. So when it's optimized, we believe the I value should be about 0.1 uh, milliwatt per square centimeter. So that's a very rough approximation. I'm not going to pretend that that's like the best way to do this quantitatively, but it, it is a good qualitative measure of where it should be. This is why we couldn't experimentally observe it because we can't excite at that low a power and actually measure the optical power properly. So it shows you this thing is absolutely amazing. And then of course, all of the, all of the plots wind up giving you normalized um, up conversion efficiencies. The highest one that we can measure is 42.7%, which is the average right through here. But we believe that's simply reflecting 40% with the N plus or minus our experimental error. And 40% is really the maximum you can get um, from diphenylanthracene in our opinion. So this sensitizer got us to the maximum at a power density that's actually lower then if you integrate the absorption band over the entire over the entire solar spectrum range it's actually less than 19 milliwatts so we think we can actually run this particular up conversion with sunlight at one sun at the highest possible efficiency which is quite amazing to us and as i told you the up conversion efficiency seems to scale with the fluorescence quantum yield. So what I told you earlier was, is the fluorescence quantum yield seems to be the thing limiting this value, which is kind of amazing to us. Um, and that's what I tell you here. And then just this zirconium force sensitizer just simply outperformed all other molecular sensitizers we've used or anyone else's used to date. So pretty remarkable stuff. Um, to finish um, on a last topic, I wanted to just do some chemistry now. So you can actually use visible light initiated polymerization by using now, instead of heteromolecular triplet triplet annihilation, we can use homomolecular, which means that the triplet excited state of the porphyrin will annihilate to produce, interestingly enough, the ground state porphyrin and then the upper S2 excited state of the porphyrin. The S2 excited state will then engage in excited state electron transfer in our particular case with an acrylate solvent. And then that actually promotes the free radical polymerization. So 
here's some of the concepts. Um, again, nothing has changed except that the acceptor annihilator is also the sensitizer. That's the only thing that's changed. And this was first developed um, uh, by a group, in, by the Soviet group in 1980. So these are metallated porphyrins, but they're mag magnesium porphyrins. Um, but then more recently, um, especially with zinc TPP, th this has really been pioneered by Ron Steer up in, up in Canada. Um, but really showing the fact that you can do triple triple annihilation in the porphyrin itself. Which for many of us that do triplet annihilation photochemistry, we all know that there's a background porphyrin annihilation going on that we always ignore. And that's one of the things that limits the efficiency. And that's why the zinc compound doesn't do it because the zinc compound doesn't self quench and it doesn't annihilate with other zinc compounds because of the way we do the experiment. Um, but anyway, let's kind of put the energy level picture on this. And the idea is, these are the potentials of the zinc uh, TPP um, singlet and triplet, but the S2 excited state, which is really Saray excitation, if you want, um, really gives you a higher energy excited state. And this is the only one that's downhill to actually um, be quenched by electron transfer from these acrylates. And we use methyl acrylate as a as a surrogate because it won't polymerize. If we use our typical cross-linked acrylate, this polymerizes right in the cuvette and it's very difficult to get uh, spectroscopic measurements. Um, it's a lot easier if what you start polymerizing is still soluble. Um, that's the only reason we use methyl acrylate. Um, but just to show you, if we do energy, electron transfer from the singlet or the triplet, they're both uphill. Obviously, you can see that they're both uphill. They won't happen. Um, but from S2, it's downhill. It's the only downhill process. And I can tell you now, every single um, control experiment has shown S2 is the only way to get this to polymerize. So here's my student, Nancy. So you, you see that I have a lot of um, photographs. This is now video in real time showing you how quick this polymerization occurs. Literally with a laser pointer in, in, the, in the confines of seconds, you can, you can make uh, polymers that actually span across a, a very large path length. So this is really awesome in consideration of three-dimensional printing. So we really think that this is going to have like a really some really cool applications moving forward. And these are just examples in the video of really macroscopic polymerization. And what's really cool is we work with some uh, chemical engineers. And if we excite longer on the same spot, it stiffens the gel because you get more cross linking. So the idea really is, is you can control the mechanical properties of the material with the length of time that you're doing the, the photolysis. And then um, Antti Bui, who was a former postdoc, did all of these beautiful images. And now what I want to show you is we do photon up conversion um, with the same acrylates. But what we do is we do this in a confocal uh, laser uh, scanning microscope. And we can actually draw images. This is supposed to be the NC State Wolf. Um, it looks more like a puppy to me, but but it's okay. It look it looks pretty nice, and it gives you an idea of the resolution that can be achieved. And we can do um, photolithography as well, so that this is through a TEM grid. So the idea is that with TMPTA, which is a cross-linking monomer, which is also a pure solvent, you can basically do ultra fast quenching of the excited state of the S2 in the porphyrin. But how do we know we do that? And you knew I wouldn't leave it there. I'd have to show you how do we know it's the S2 quenching by electron transfer? So for this particular case, we have to use fluorescence upconversion, but not photochemical upconversion. This is really femtosecond optically gated fluorescence upconversion. So this is how you can get lifetimes of Loom of fluorescent excited states that are ultra fast time scale. The idea really is, is we have a, a Thai sapphire laser that's an oscillator, and then we use the 800 nanometer beam as what's called the gating beam, which, which enters into this some frequency generating crystal. 
And then we can delay the time that that gate pulse arrives with a delay stage. That's how we get the timing for the experiment. But then we come in with um, the same pulse split, split it into a 400 nanometer beam because it goes through a second harmonic generator. And then that hits the sample that's gonna fluoresce. The fluorescence gets collected in this parabolic mirror collection uh, system and then focused into this some frequency generation crystal. So where the spatially and temporally overlap, you get a time dependent up conversion signal. The time dependence is based on the intensities of the two signals. The gate is always constant intensity. The fluorescence is a time, uh, it, it's basically a time dependent signal. So this generates an upconverted signal that's proportional to the fluorescence decay of the sample itself on ultra fast time scales. And what you do, what you then do is in toluene, this is the S2 fluorescence of the porphyrin. And then if we add the TMPTA, which I told you is, is a dangerous experiment because it polymerizes, you see the lifetime shorten. A better experiment is in acetonitrile where things are more soluble and the lifetime of the porphyrin is a little longer. The S2 excited state is here, but you can see systematically with increasing concentration of the TMPTA acrylate, we get a linear sternvona plot. And they look weird because now we're doing ultra fast quenching, so they're way above diffusion limits. That's why it's 10 to the 11 per molar per second. But it verifies the fact that you can absolutely see that we're getting dynamic quenching of the S2 excited state in the porphyrin by the acrylates. We do steady state experiments, Q band, no Q band fluorescence, no influence whatsoever on the porphyrin concentration. The Saray band fluorescence goes down. The polarity is changing a little bit. That's why the wavelength changes. But in essence, you can see here by steady state measurements too, you can even see that we're actually getting quenching of the Saray emission, but really, if anything, anti-quenching in terms of the Q-band emission. So this is all coming from the S2 excited state, not from the S1 excited state. And as the warning I told you, you see what happens to the Q-vets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then you have to use no chromix to clean them out. So um, I would not try to do these it's very efficient polymerizing. Do not do this in cuvettes if you want to not have to worry about cleaning them out. Um, and then finally, uh, we use methyl acrylate as the surrogate, as I told you, because it won't polymerize. And again, uh, just looking at the static quenching of the S2 fluorescence in, in this as a function of concentration very clearly feeds us back the same data we got from the time resolved experiment. So again, just dynamic quenching, but it's ultra fast quenching, which I will tell everybody, I wasn't the first to come up with this either. Eric Vothny's group in Switzerland did this way back in 2002 and showed you can do ultra fast excited state electron transfer quenching from zinc PP's uh, S2 excited state. So there's been a whole host of work that's been done that really inspired a lot of the things that we have done. And uh, this is the paper we published in chem on this uh, subject at the end of last year. Okay. Um, that was all the technical stuff I wanted to bring up and I wanna just end really quick um, by again, um, just saying that we launched chemical physics reviews in a pandemic, so nobody really knows about it yet and, and almost no libraries uh, subscribe to it at present. Um, but I'm the editor in chief and I wanna just say that we have a really talented group of worldwide um, associate editors, including Nobu, who's our, our co-host today. Um, I know uh, Hyrung is here too. I saw her in the audience and I'm not sure if anyone else is actually here today from, uh, from this group, but um, across, uh, across the world, we have all of these associate editors. And if you think that you're interested in um, contributing, I will tell you that um, even though it says reviews, we actually consider original research as well as reviews in all of these different areas of uh, physical chemistry and chemical physics and all the areas that you know, fall in between all of these subjects. And uh, if you wanna learn more about CPR, uh, this, is the, this is the website. 
Um, but I would encourage you to, you know, contact me or contact any of the associate editors if you, you know, are interested in potentially contributing uh, to this new endeavor from AIP Publishing. Okay, uh, so with that, let me thank everybody for putting up with me for the last hour or so. Um, and I will tell you I was requested to speak for an hour, which is why I covered all those subjects. Um, everybody highlighted in red contributed something to this project that I spoke about today. Um, like I said, I don't do most of the experiments or any of the experiments these days, but I have a really massive group of talented people that have helped over the years and they're all listed here. Um, there's a, a, of course, the list is long and very distinguished, so I have to still go into the, the next. <laughs> Uh, the next phase of, of things here too. And, and I should also tell you, I have had a visiting doctoral student uh, from, from Japan visit as well as from China. So um, one of which actually contributed to the project I, I showed today, one of the projects I showed today. Um, and I will have to go back to my original students, Dennis and, and Raddy, who really started us in this photochemical web conversion business. Those are the people that really deserve, um, you know, a lot of the credit uh, from the very beginning of, of the work my group did. Um, and then uh, my, my hope is we can now uh, take a, another group photo very soon because everybody in the group is vaccinated. Uh, but I had to find the latest time we took a picture. This was in um, effectively the winter, which is January of 2020. North Carolina is generally pretty warm. That's why we're not really like in coats here. Um, but this is like really before the pandemic hit. And th this was the, the group of folks that um, are in uh, or in the group at the time. Several of these people have moved on at this point. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to all of them for all of their contributions to this and many other projects that we work on. Um, myself and the group have a Twitter account. Um, this, these are the group's uh, Instagram and Facebook accounts, if anyone's interested. And then I have to thank NC State because they, they provide me with this Goodnight Innovation Share funding, which helps us fund a lot of, a lot of projects in interesting ways. Um, but who specifically paid for the work I talked about today was primarily the Department of Energy with my single PI award, as well as the BioLEC Energy Frontier Research Center. Um, the work on our nanomaterial project, which I only had one slide on, was supported by um, AFOSR. And with that, I will uh, thank all of you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. And again, thank you so much for uh, enduring me for the last hour. Okay, so thank you very much, Phil, for your really great talk. So uh, I really think it's it was very a uh, great opportunity to know the whole history of your app conversion research. So especially, I didn't know how you begin this, you know, research, and it's good to know. And and also, we enjoyed very much, very you know. Uh, variety of the sensitizer and emitter and, and how it's very powerful and I was particularly impressed by your recent walks on the zirconium sensitizers. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. yeah thank you so much. So okay so it's very good occasion so uh, we can ask, accept uh, many questions so if you have some questions please use the maybe raise hand or you can just unmute and start to ask. So Yuto, please start your question. Hello, uh, thank you for the great talk. And um, could you go back to the slide 25? Yes. It's easy to do this when it's not shared. Oh, sorry, 22. I got it here, 22, I got it here. Where I, you I, have I, copper complexes. Yeah, I've got it here. I just wanted to, I wanted to get to the, I like getting to the slide and then sharing it again. That, that way it's on the slide and I don't have to bore everybody with this. Okay. Uh, I think slide 22. 22. This one. Um, could you explain again why the rightmost complex performs the best? I remember that you mentioned about sterics, but I think the difference between the green one and blue one is the only methyl group. 
at the uh, oh, great. Yeah. yeah, that's a great like. Um, yeah, it's a great question. In fact, um, this is very good physical inorganic chemistry. I'm happy I got this question because I, I I tend to like these questions. Um, so the methyl group um, really, um, if you look at the if you look at sort of the the absorption spectrum of this, it's it's red. So you see how this has a tail, and if you blow it up, that you see this tail. What that's telling you is in the ground state. This is exhibiting more of a D2 geometry, which the D2 geometry is a little bit distorted with respect to the starting like tetrahedral D2, uh, D2 D geometry. And the way that this manifests itself is you start to get an, an allowed MLCT transition when the molecule is a little more distorted. And then the idea is when it's more distorted, that then typically is telling you that it has more freedom when you make the excited state to then distort even further. And that's why it ends up being like a red emitting compound like that has a peak about 750 nanometers. It's because um, in the excited state, you go from copper, not copper, oh, I'm sorry, copper one, which is D10, formally to copper one, or sorry, <laughs> I got this backwards. You start out copper one, D10, and then you formally oxidize it to copper two, which is D9. And when you oxidize it to D9, the idea really is, is that you get this pseudo Jan Teller distortion which then distorts the molecule even further to sort of accommodate um, the fact that it doesn't want to have degenerate um, unoccupied orbitals. And that's really, the result of that is you get a bigger stoke shift and then the energy gap law tells you that that's more favorable for non-radiative decay to the ground state. So the DMP compound is, is like under hundred nanosecond lifetime. This, is a little bit better, but what I want to what I want to show you is is that without having the flanking methyl groups, you see that the absorption band still kind of tails. So there is a, still a reasonable degree of distortion here, and then that manifests itself in it's it's still distorted a little bit, and then it's able to distort even further in the excited state, which leads again to a redder emission. But if you put the methyl groups here, you see what happens? This all kind of blue shifts. Oh, sorry. I, this all kind of blue shifts and you, you largely eliminate that low energy band. So it's telling you you're more in the D2T geometry in the ground state. It's, it's really because this, the sec butyl groups are forced down. Like it, it's better to see this in three dimensions, but what you're doing is it's hugging the copper this way and from the other direction this way. So it's sort of really protecting the um, coordination environment very in a very um, directional manner, as opposed to what happens in these molecules when you don't have three, five or three, eight substituents. So that's really the critical element here. And that ultimately manifests itself in the fact that you don't distort as much. And then the lifetime really gets very long because now your um, emission is a lot bluer and then the radiative rate constant or the, uh, sorry, the, the non-radiative rate constant decreases a lot because of the energy gap law. And that, that's really what is controlling everything. Hmm. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Actually, do you also, uh, can you see the difference also in the single crystal X-ray structure? You can, yeah, you, you can actually calculate it by DFT too. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you can see it in, in both. Um, the problem is with sec butyl, we can't really crystallize it because we mm -hmm. have four chiral, we have four chiral centers, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So like that that that's a that's a nightmare to crystallize and to, <laughs> to understand. Um, but we have other molecules that you can crystallize. 
Um, but you can absolutely calculate all of this mm -hmm. using pretty straightforward DFT with not too complex functionals. So that that's what's really good about it. You can predict what will happen pretty regularly now than without having to make the compound first, which is ideal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Yuto. And let me move to uh, the question from Christoph. So please. Hi. First of all, I want to thank the organizers, Nobu and his team, for making this great event possible, even in Germany, without traveling. Well, Phil, we got indeed some inspiration from you and your numerous contributions to the upconversion field, and I really enjoyed your talk, including the history of your first upconversion experiment. Of course, I have a question, and it is related to your zirconium DPA system, which you introduced on slide 33 or 34, I guess. It seems to be the ideal system for photochemists, like a dream system, so a high quantum yield and the linear, the unusual linear power dependence. Uh, yeah, and I just want to ask if there's any disadvantage. Okay. Um, it yes, seems that the anti-Stokes shift is not so large. Yeah, the, yeah, you know, this, this is, yeah, the, this is always the challenge is I ideally, we would love this zirconium photosensitizer to absorb in the near infrared, but it, it just doesn't. Um, so, so we sort of, we sort of, you know, decided um, to, when we go to the, the, the spectra always, I think, are the thing that, that really tells you everything that you need. Yeah. So, so basically we recognized immediately that this is a good surrogate for the Q band of a lot of the porphyrins that we've used in the past. And as, a, as the first really proof of principle, we just said we should just do yellow and green to blue of conversion. And the reason we said blue would be good is really the fact that the absorption band here um, hits a minimum and we would avoid a lot of the interfilter effects. And the key thing really was um, in terms of zirconium, was we figured, let's at least do one thing different. Can we get to this maximum 40% efficiency? That was really what drove us. And what the surprise was, is the combination of the fact that the zirconium has no deleterious side reactions. So it doesn't annihilate. We, could, we actually did this experiment. This is what's crazy, Christoph, is, um, all of these experiments, this is what is shocking when you really think about it, is the absorption of the zirconium at the excitation wavelength here is 0.2. <laughs> and we can get away with that because the extinction coefficient is really high. It's like 30,000. The lifetime is 350 microseconds. And it has just all of these amazing properties that, that really were amenable to like, can we vary the blue emitter and still get, you know, really high efficiencies across the board? And, and clearly it, it works. Obviously, it's not the, it's not the up conversion mixture that's going to really solve any significant problems, but we, we, we wanted just to prove that we could get to the 40% number with a molecular system under benign conditions. And, and I think that that was really the driver of, of, the, of this sequence of experiments. Yeah, I totally agree. You presented us outstanding results here. And I guess they are still unpublished, right? It's in revision at Chemical Science. Right? Oh, okay, okay. I'm looking forward to reading it and... and... Oh. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm hoping they. I'm hoping they accept it. We'll 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 see that it was um, what ha what happened was one of the reviewers wanted us to explain better the forty percent number, so we had to go through the spin statistics. So that was that was like that was one of the we had to write a whole paragraph on that, and I think it's funny because most people in this field sort of know why 
you know, why that number is important. And you don't like, you don't even have to think about it anymore. Um, but, but I understand it's, you know, a broader audience really needs to know the, those details. So um, that, that's what, uh, that's what kind of, I think was the only concern that held it up, but, uh, but we'll see. And, Car and Karsten's amazing. Yeah. So I get to work with the German this way too. So Car Karsten's amazing. He's a, he's one of the, he's really a, one of the most upbeat collaborators I've ever worked with in, in every way, shape and form. And he's got more compounds. So he has, he has eight coordinate zinc comp, zinc four compounds. Like you, you're going to see a lot of interesting things over the next year or two from, from our groups, I think. Yeah, first off, and congratulations on your new position too. I, I wanted to tell you, I haven't seen you in person since you started there. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Congratulations and thank you for the question and good to know that you are, you like, you enjoy this talk. And a uh, few uh, related to this topic. So um, could you explain a bit more about the, the, maybe the comparison with, for example, the PDOEP or PTOEP, the porphyrin uh, complex, like, you know, you know, uh, in, in terms of efficiency, it's kind of similar, but it's quite impressive and it's amazing that you estimate the kind of 0.1, you know, milliwatt per square centimeter of threshold excitation intensity. That's amazing. So, uh, could you explain which uh, parameters or maybe only absorption can affect? The um, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So here's the here's the the real. Um, so here's the like. So the other thing I didn't mention is we we actually measure all of this as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what we're able to do in all of, in all of this was obviously this is the rough, um, estimation. Mm -hmm. This equation really doesn't account for everything. And like, you know, Tim Schmidt wrote this paper even like two years ago that like just says there's a lot of other considerations besides these uh, four parameters. But as a first approximation, um, these four parameters are pretty good because you have this, you have this nice feed. Not, well, what I like about it is for us, this number's fixed, this number's fixed. We can change this and we can play with this a little bit. Um, but what this doesn't tell you is the competing processes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are competing with the annihilation that you want to see and this like and of course this the triplet decay from the from the acceptor itself so the problem uh that you know kind of comes up with this is one of which is there's the problem that you also don't see here of um the inner filter effects that are really bad from the serrae band of a porphyrin like that's the first major limiting factor using porphyrins as up conversion sensitizers when you're up converting into the blue. You're contending with extinction coefficients that are hundreds of thousands. And that's just really hard to mitigate. And you get a lot of you get a lot of light reabsorption by the porphyrin. And of course, that's not accounted for here. That's the that's really the first problem. The the second problem uh that really isn't accounted for here and this is the thing all of us know happens but we never really deal with it is when you do transient absorption of just the porphyrin it's pulse energy dependent everybody knows it the higher the pulse energy the faster the decay kinetics which tells you the porphyrin self-annihilates mm -hmm. So the porphyrin self-annihilation under most of these experimental conditions where people are using high power that's a competing process. Mm -hmm. And that's taking out two excited porphyrin triplets um, as a function of power too. So as you're increasing power, you're actually decreasing your, your porphyrin triple concentration, which affects the energy transfer of the first reaction. So that's a competitive pathway that really, I know we've never dealt with, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody else really concern themselves with. Um, and then the, um, the other thing, of course, is porphyrins will self-quench. Mm -hmm. So they will aggregate. That's, self, that's a self-quenching mechanism as well. 
Our zirconium compound does not aggregate. We did all the NMR experiments to prove it. Um, it and it also does not engage in, you know, triple triple annihilation with itself. Um, so it basically circumvents every single, um, power, like I would say, competitive pathway of what, you know, I talked about today. So I think there's zirconium sensitizer just doesn't have these deleterious pathways. And that's why magically, um, I saw that data the first time from my student. I said, I want to see you do the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, it's like, I don't believe this. Like, why isn't it going quadratic? What's wrong? What did you do wrong? Right. You, you like, you know, UV lights breaking through. Right, right. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was like, you're doing something wrong. And then, you know, she did it like five or six more times. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you're like, why? And then it's like, do it with other acceptors. We had a bunch that some other that a postdoc may do with those two. All of them are linear. And I'm like, Go back to Rubippi, prove to me that this is quadratic. She did. And then I, then I said, okay, well, how are you doing this? And I said, okay, what were the energy transfer efficiency? Let's make sure it's quadratic. And then it was. And then it, then it all hit me that, oh, it's zirconium is just not in this class like all of these other porphyrins. Plus there's zirconium is like 350 microseconds, but it's also a TADF molecule. So it's not quenched by trace oxygen as much as you would think either. So there's a lot of cool things about it that really make it special. Um, and, you know, like I said, we were surprised. I did not expect this compound to behave this way. Right. If I if I told you I expected that, I'd be lying to you. I never expected it to be the best sensitizer we've seen in 20 years. It, it ne never in a million years would I have thought that. Um, but I do think it, it's eliminating all of the competition mm -hmm. or all of the competing mechanisms is what is advantageous about using it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's very, yeah, that's the reason why that's very, it's, I, yeah, it's very amazing. Sensors and, and congratulations for finding that. And well, it's Karsten. I, I didn't yeah, make well, it. But Car it's Car great. Karsten knows me. It <laughs> but it's great collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Kiyoshi, uh, please. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, all right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you yeah, really very much for a really, really exciting talk. So um, I'm kind of a uh, newcomer for uh, this field and I'm really glad that uh, now I uh, feel the, how can I say, how those synthesizers and also how the system developed in last uh, maybe one or two decades. Yeah. I'm still uh, thinking about why this zirconium uh, synthesizer behaves such a, such amazingly. So and my question would be, so you said that um, the molecular orbital distribution in this zirconium complex is a little bit different from the uh, other one. Like, so this is not typical MLCD, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It, it actually is, um, it's a ligand to metal charge transfer, but it's, it's not 100% ligand to metal charge transfer. It's like, I think it's 40% ligand to metal charge transfer and 60% ligand centered. So you have to, th these are calculations from Karsten. Um, my group didn't do these. Um, but if you look at the frontier transitions here, um, so, you know, sort of the ones that, you know, were really concerning are the ones here, is you sort of see that um, the, the, the transition here is 45% zirconium character. So zirconium is accepting, um, is the acceptor orbital here. Um, but then um, in some of the other ones, uh, what you find is, is that this has like no zirconium character and it's all ligand centered. So there's this mixture of, you know, ligand to metal charge transfer in conjunction with ligand centered character. And I think it's those two things that really conspire to give you this really interesting excited state properties. Because it's not it's not typical that you see TADF mm -hmm. in a and in a lot of molecules, and it's even stranger that this is I think the first example in a ligand and metal charge transfer compound. Mm -hmm. So, 
it, it's got all of these interesting characteristics, but then it has that ridiculous excited state lifetime. I see. And, so and it's like, you, like, I don't think on paper you could have predicted any of this. Yeah, yeah. I, so, so see, and, uh, I have another question. Uh, yeah, I understand that this one is TDF, but and for a couple of complexes, that one is also TDF. Is, is that right? Yes, they have. Yes, you. Yeah, we we go into those details with copper all the time. Um, yeah, you. They they are. Um, it's the lowest energy triplet metal to ligand charge transfer excited state, but the singlet is only about, depending on the compound, only about fourteen hundred to eighteen hundred wave numbers above it. So it's you can thermally activate to the to the uh, the singlet MLCT state at room temperature. Um, so yeah, co yeah, copper has the same uh, has the same uh, processes except that they're metal to ligand mm -hmm. in character, and there's no ligand centered character in the copper complexes. It's all 100% um, MLCT. So okay, so both are TDF and one is MLCT and one is LMCT. So and the lifetime looks really really different. So so just like kind of want to hear your opinion of what is the biggest difference between MSCT and LMCT in terms of this kind of uh, photophysics uh, character or something? Yeah, I can, I can teach an entire class on that one. Um, but, but what I would tell you is um, the reason why there's a conium is so long lived, we think is because of these intra ligand excited states. So it's, it's got like, it's excited state manifold has a lot of ligand center character. And, that, and that's what's imparting this really, really long hundreds of microsecond lifetime. With copper, um, the singlet and the triplet are both metal to ligand in charge transfer and character. And they're, you know, and, and they're just not, um, in, in fact, the singlet MLCT is shortening the triplet lifetime. That's like ultimately what happens at room temperature. So it, so, that's the real difference is the copper systems don't have any ligand centered character. So there's nowhere that copper can go to get long lifetimes unless you purposefully create copper chromophores that, that have the center character, which some, which some people are doing um, for sure. Um, but as far as I know, they've never been used in a photochemical up conversion experiment. Oh, yeah, thank you about that. No, no, I think better understanding of that. So can I move to the different question for actually the last topic? Uh, sure. Zinc, zinc TPP. So um, so I'm really amazed that the photochemical uh, or this kind of up conversion and uh, photochemical reaction from S2 happened. So, and I found like this uh, zinc TPP is kind of uh, breaking the Kasha rule. So, I guess my question would be, so the first one is, so how is the uh, quantum efficiency of this up-converted polymerization? See, see the, 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 that's, that's the right question. So you see, when you're, when you're producing light and you're trying to produce stoichiometric reaction chemistry with photochemical up-conversion, you need super high efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The good news is for free radical polymerization, you have to you need one electron to initiate it, then it goes. So you don't need it to be efficient. Oh. So, so this is ideal for using an S2 excited state that has a lifetime of a couple of picoseconds to drive a, to drive a reaction. It, and, and that's the beauty of free radical polymerization is that you actually, because it's so inefficient, um, you can kind of control the material really well as a result. And, and, that, and that's what's, because I think what you have to do is, if you do the usual acrylate photo activation with ultraviolet light, and you had an ultraviolet light source, you'll turn that entire sample solid like in seconds. But if you do this like inefficient up conversion, you can penetrate all the way through and draw the object in effectively a three-dimensional. Well, 
you're really not controlling the third dimension because it just goes right through, but you can, you can make a two dimensional object very easily. And, and, that, and, and it's more controlled in, nice. in a way, spatially controlled. And, and that's, the, that's the real difference. And um, that's why we, we kind of think that this is gonna be really interesting because I, I, I can tell you my chemical engineering colleagues that kind of do this stuff for a living, when Nancy went over there and they're helping us characterize the mechanical properties, they, they were like stunned at the stuff they were seeing. They said, I cannot, they could not believe that you could do it this way. And you know, that, that told me everything that the people that do this for a living are excited about the prospect of doing it this way. Um, and again, this is just one example and we use Zinc TPP because of Eric Vonthi's work. So it's always, you gotta, you gotta borrow from the literature. Eric Vonthi is the one that showed you can do excited state electron transfer from the S2 excited state to solvent quenchers. That's what gave us this idea. Oh yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah it's really a uh, nice combination. Yeah, and demonstration. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, it's very really great idea to use this for the, yeah, for your position. It's amazing. So, yeah, I, I think I think probably we'll be seeing more and more people doing this with time. Mm -hmm. Is my guess. Um, but the fact is, is it it really does work. Right, right. And that's what that's what the engineers really cared about is like they mm. just like to see it working. And then they say, well, you can systematically change the gel, you know, the gel properties of these uh, mm -hmm. of these polymers in a pretty systematic fashion. And they, they were and they, they like the fact that you can write it over like a meter. <laughs> As they say, that's like really cool that you could do it. You know, you can write across something in, in a very uh, in a very controlled manner which I thought was pretty interesting too. That's very interesting. Okay, so uh, Shinsuke, please. Hi, thank you for a very good presentation. Like I had a quite simple and small question regarding the polymer part. Like you told us that like the monomers, a metric grade is working as a quencher for S2 state. But yes. Yeah, sir, like in that sense, like after polymerization, does our S2 J fluorescence will be recovered? Like in other words, can you detect the endpoint of the polymerization by checking the dose emission properties? Um, yeah, actually, I don't have the images here, unfortunately. Um, but in the yeah, so in this fluorescence microscope images, like we have actually the porphyrin that's that's trapped in there fluoresces. So yeah, you can image all of this stuff with fluorescence too, which I did. I'm, I'm just showing you the transmission images here, but you can, um, but you can actually generate uh, the colored fluorescence images as well, which is kind of neat. Um, and they can be washed out is the other thing. Um, we, wash the, we wash the systems okay. of the porphyrin after the fact too. So you can actually have like a clear material at the end, which is what most people want. They don't, they don't want to have residual um, colored photosensitizer absorbing all the light after the fact. Um, and that's why we have like um, the chemical engineering people are the ones that help us understand swelling ratios and you know all, all of these parameters that I never even knew anything about, they know all about. And, <laughs> and they're the ones that you know, kind of are informing me, oh, this is great that you can, you can absolutely do this. Um, it were, I'll tell you, we have the data with a lot of other systems. You can do this in water too. It, it works with hydrogels as well. This is just the organic example, but we have we have like aqueous based examples too. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so Chehuk. Okay, uh, thank you for a uh, wonderful talk. I really enjoyed your seminar. Oh, good, hope... good seeing you again. Wow, it's yeah. been a long time. Hey, congratulations on your position as well. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, my question is about the uh, host material of the TTF conversion material. So the TTF host material 
started from the deoxygenated organic solvent and then moved to uh, soft uh, solid materials like polyurethane. And then these days, uh, lots of TTF conversion host materials with different shape and configurations are reported, like nanoparticles, microparticles, micelles, thin films, and organo and hydrogels, such like that. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so I uh, actually uh, would like to hear your, your thoughts on what will be the uh, next generation uh, host material for uh, TTF conversion and uh, uh, which types or shape of uh, TTF conversion host material will be the most uh, challenging things. Oh, okay. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So my my sense my sense is is that um, let me stop sharing for a sec. That's better. Um, that way I can see you better. Um, so what I would say is is the the general ideas are that that I think are are very are very compelling is um, like Oliver Wenger's group is and and you know and and Christoph has done a lot of this work when he was in Oliver's group and now he's on his own. Um, but I think they would agree a, a very powerful way to move forward in this is to start, you know, applying photochemical up conversion to generate ultraviolet light to drive really high energy reactions that are valuable in photoredox catalysis for, you know, for basically making commodity chemicals. And the way to do that is in order to make the upconversion systems compatible with those particular reactions, a lot of times those reactions are taking place in polar organic solvents. And that's to drive the electron transfer chemistry that's needed to make and break uh, the chemical bonds that are going on in all of those systems. And we, we do this too. And the, the problem is, is getting an upconversion system that can be encapsulated in a material that's then compatible with those polar organic solvents. Like, I think that is a really big challenge um, to figure that out and, and to be able to use it in a way that the up conversion can be maximized and has to be transparent so that the light can transmit out into the solution so that it can photoactivate um, the photoredox process that you're trying to drive. So I think that's the, that, that to me is, I think the heart, the single hardest challenge. And, you know, the way my group has kind of done this and the way Oliver's group's done this and a few others is we physically separate. So we basically do the up conversion in like one optical compartment. And then, you know, you do, you do the react, the photoredox reaction in a different compartment. And you know, while that works, um, it'd be better if it was homogeneous because then um, you could actually do the reactions much more effectively. And, and I think that that's one place I see um, a real need is can you get materials that support nonpolar upconversion reactions to generate light, but do it in concert with polar organic media that are hosting usually three, four or five component mixtures. And it, it's, it's a real, uh, it ends up being a soup. <laughs> and then you have to be able to separate everything at the end. And you, ideally you wanna reuse the photochemical up conversion system again. You don't wanna throw it out because that's got all the precious, uh, you know, usually the precious metal photosensitizers most of the time. So that, that I think that that's what I would say is the single challenge and at least in the synthesis approach to, to photochemical up conversion. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you. And I agree that, you know, we, our community should provide very useful and very easy to use materials that works in any, you know, any solvent so that the other community, other community or synthetic chemistry community can very easy to buy and get and then just dump in and then shine and then work. So, right. <laughs> so we need to make yeah. such a, you know, very easy to use material to expand the application of this beautiful conversion. So, okay. So yeah. it's a good idea for a company if you can, if you can pull it off. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so Yoichi, please. Hi, Phil. Uh, can Hi. you can hear me? Uh, thank you so much for your impressive talk. <laughs> I really enjoyed how you studied and, and uh, your current research. And I have a question about your zirconium sensitizer. Your zirconium sensitizer. Um, do you have any ideas about the relationship between ligand structure and intersystem crossing rate of the sensitizer? Because when we think about the application to treat TTA, we need high ISC efficiency and we don't need the emissive TADF and low emissive TADF we need. And when we think about uh, OLED, of course we need a high emissive TADF. So I'm very curious about the relationship. Okay, um, I can give you the answer for that one compound. Um, we, we have, um, Intersystem crossing in that particular zirconium sensitizer, so mesotiol and phenyl, was less than 10 picoseconds. So it was, it's relatively fast. We have another study with Karsten where they did systematic structural property changes um, to the ligands. And we haven't actually put that together in a manuscript yet, but my postdoc, mm -hmm. Tia Lee, who I think is here, um, is the one that you know, kind of is studying that. And I do think there is a systematic variation with structure in the intersystem crossing rate, but I don't know the details of, of what the structures are and what the rates are. I know we're studying it, but I don't know the specific details, but I think there is a relationship. We just, um, I'm just not able to tell you what it is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very excited and hope uh, future study will clarify the detail. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. And uh, any other questions from the audience? Hi, okay, please. I have a question about the uh, um, future of photovoltaic conversion. Your new zirconium system makes really high quantum yields, about 40%, right? And uh, is it possible to reach 100% or above 50% in new future? Because you mentioned your, uh, uh, the uh, uh, equation is really old and we can somehow uh, we should think some new theoretical limit or just, uh, yeah, what, what about uh, future of photon photo conversion? Okay, that, yeah, so what is going to be necessary to, to really get beyond what's possible with molecules like the ones we use? It, it, it simply comes, comes to the fact that when you do triplet, triplet annihilation, you generate um, a quintet state, um, triplet and, and singlet. And, and the problem is, is that where you come to this 40% is, is that you kind of assume, okay, well, the quintets won't form, so they go back and make more triplets. And then typically the, the triplets that are produced um, have, have this option of, you know, staying as triplets or um, going back to the ground state. And then the only thing that produces light is the singlet. Um, and it turns out that one ninth of that mixture is, is, is singlet. And that, that would tell you with all the things I've been saying, like multiplying by two, that's, like, that's an 11% efficiency. Um, but if you assume that you recycle everything from all of those things that can, that can revert back to triplets, you can get to this maximum of 40%. So the way out of that is you have to somehow figure out how do you, how do you manipulate spin in a way that you can harness some of those upper excited states and not just waste them. And I think that is you know, really difficult because those states are very short lived. And I think the quintet has never been detected even at this, you know, to date, because it's, it, it's, it, it's really high energy to make. 
you have to basically put four parallel spins on 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 two molecules that are in a in a in a cage to, in you know in a solvent cage together. So that's really energetically unfavorable. Um, and I think the the only ways to manipulate that are going to have to be you know using materials that can manipulate the spin somehow. And I personally have no idea how to do this. Um, but in terms of molecular upconversion, I think we, we showed the 40% just to show that you can get to that maximum and then get to it at, a, at an incident power that's incredibly low. So for me, that was very satisfying because we start, when we started doing this in 2003, I never thought it would even get to where it, it has, has gotten to. Um, but it's going to be how to manipulate these um, paramagnetic species, I think, is going to be the answer. And I'll tell you what, no, Nobu is much more knowledgeable about all of the spin than I am. And, and maybe he has a better answer. I, I might defer to him as what he thinks might, might work and might not work. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge because like right now, in solution with molecules, we just are extracting what nature gives us. Mm -hmm. And we're not, yep. we're not manipulating anything. And I think no one has done any manipulation. Yeah, of, I understand of, of that. that. And, and yeah, that's where, yeah, that, that's what, I, at least that's what I think. Um, no, Nobu probably is better, has, <laughs> has an idea, but you don't have to tell people because if you're working on it, don't give away your ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in this case, I think you somehow use uh, TADF materials for both, both uh, synthesizer and annihilator, right? And yes. if we can use some summary activation from triplet state to singlet state, we can probably forget about uh, some triplet, triplet annihilation spin state problems, right? In, yeah, I think so. And yeah, in this case, it, is there, uh, can you um, separate the TTA annihilation and the summary activated uh, uh, delayed fluorescence ratio in your spectroscopy mm. study? I'd say maybe. I never thought about that one before. It, sound, it sounds like it, it should be possible because if one of the processes is thermally activated, you should be able to use temperature to manipulate it. And then, you know, com you know combine with transient and static spectroscopy, I'd imagine you should be able to get to it somehow. I just, I never thought about it from that perspective. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with Phil that you know this, uh, to you know it's a remaining challenge to uh, go over the spin statistical limit of the conversion and then, well, uh, hopefully <laughs> our community will find the answer to that and that will be the very big important uh, scientific finding. Maybe maybe waiting for us, but <laughs> we'll see. Pankaj, please go ahead. Actually, yeah, I'm actually in the laser room. That's why I posted okay. my question. I posted my question. Can you read it? Because there's okay, a okay, okay. I, I can read it for you. Yeah, so, I got it. I got it here. Yeah, so okay, you okay, should, okay. You should, that way you, yeah, you should probably read it for everybody, though. Just Okay, so uh, Pankaj has a question about integration of solar cells with band gap in the 450 to 550 nanometer for the integration with TTA UC materials. Is there any solar cell which can function in this wavelength range? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, almost every single DSSC that's ever been made is, is optimized in that range, as well as most uh, organic-based solar cells. Um, it's usually these, it's like these next generation solar cell materials that really are optimized to work in the blue and the green. Um, and yeah, those, those are the ones that I think um, the, this technology would particularly target because we're, we're obviously only going to help silicon if we can get, you know, above the silicon uh, or below the silicon band gap. And that's basically the near IR to visible conversion. 
Um, but yeah, that, that was just my representative example from, uh, you know, the DSSCs from my own research group. So that was like, you know, spectra and data I had <laughs> just to illustrate the concept of how up conversion could potentially be used to increase the power conversion efficiency in, in uh, photovoltaics. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, okay, so maybe it's time to uh, finish this lecture. So, uh, thank you again, Phil. Thank you very much for giving the great talk, and we all enjoyed all the history and also uh, and also very updated uh, new data, even including some unpublished work. So we really appreciate that, and then and also uh, you know. This uh, lecture is recorded and then will be distributed through the uh, YouTube and then hopefully uh, more and more people will know about uh, this update and will be fascinated definitely and also maybe we'll join this field to make this field even more bigger and more uh, exciting. So, okay, so uh, thank you again, Phil, for your great talk and hope to see you in person. <laughs> Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nova. Yeah, and also, yeah, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you for the very nice uh, active discussion. Thank you, Kyoshi, as well. Have a good, have a good, uh, have a good evening. It's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> right, just midnight. <laughs> yeah, great, see, great seeing all of you. Take care. Can I have a really last question? Oh, oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, just I like, keep thinking about why your zirconium complex works so well. And my I, I still have a question about why your uh, quantum efficiency as uh, I mean PLQI of this uh zirconium complex is not so not so good. So um the oh the photoluminescence quantum yield? Yeah, exactly, exactly. 45. Oh, uh, 45, okay. But yeah, let me verify, verify. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, it's because it's really crazy because it. it I think it, it. You know, it gets to that because of the TADF. I see. Um, yeah, I, I'm still trying to uh, make a connection uh, between the excited state structural dynamics and this kind of um, uh, KNL. For example, I mean, um, so as you uh, explained in uh, the story of. Uh, Kappa complex. Now, I think that excited state flattening distortion would be one of the uh, stuff we need to care about. So, and my, my maybe last question would be uh, how do you think about the structural dynamics in excited state of this zirconium uh, complex? Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, so, the, so in metal to ligand charge transfer, what always happens is, is the, 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 there's a very big structural change because you oxidize the metal. Yeah. And when you oxidize the metal, that contracts all the ligands. So that's the first thing that happens. Mm -hmm. And then when you reduce the ligand by one electron, you're basically breaking all of the double bonds a little bit and that actually expands. So you got a lot of structural changes uh -huh. going on. In ligand to metal charge transfer, the opposite happens. It's a ligand-based bonding orbital that gets depleted, but that doesn't give you a big structural change. And then you're reducing the metal by one electron, which then, you know, when it's D0 and it goes to D1, again, that's not a big structural change. And you're not actually changing a lot at the metal center or the ligand environment. So because there's not as much um, structural change, the stoke shift is very small. Mm -hmm. So that's why the luminescence of it, even the, even the triplet is not really stoke shifted very much. That, nice. that's, the, that's the general, that's the ligand and metal part. Um, but then there's a lot of ligand center character too, and they're mixed. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is that it's not 100% ligand and metal charge transfer, and it's not 100% ligand centered. So it sort of has properties of, of both, and they're in between the two extremes. 
So, so the way you can think about it is the ligand and metal charge transfer would normally have very short-lived excited states and crappy quantum yields for luminescence and everything else. Mm -hmm. The ligand center, on the other hand, would have very long lifetimes, um, pretty high quantum yields for photoluminescence and all the other stuff. So what happens is when you mix them both, you get something in between. And, and that's really what the major difference happens to be with, with zirconium. Copper doesn't do that because copper doesn't have um, a ligand centered um, transition or transitions to couple to. So it, it can't really make itself longer lived than, it, than, than what you really can get from the charge transfer state. So you have no, nothing else to borrow against is what it comes down to. I see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. So I will okay. uh, study this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, more and more in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, they're really they're very they're very complex electronic structures and <laughs> that, that's yeah, try, for sure. So uh, as spectroscopics, I, I really yeah try to think about what what can we contribute to this field by like out of our spectroscopy. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, your lecture. Uh, inspired me a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Ah, yeah, my question okay. is over. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you. Great. So the, it's so ex exciting. So we cannot stop asking questions, but uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe let's stop. And uh, <laughs> thank you again, Phil. So for your nice talk, and uh, so thank you everyone. Okay, for joining. Yeah, thank you everybody. Good, good see you. Good see you again. Yeah, yeah. So, and 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 Tom the hero. I didn't forget about you. Good to see you again too. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Okay. So thank you, and see you, everyone.